in my family, we do Christmas a little bit different. We send each other gifts whenever we please. And like children, we just stare at them under the tree until we can't sit still anymore. And then we open them. I remember a Christmas where our whole family sat around. Everyone had gathered and it was like a week or two early. I was, I think, maybe six or seven. And we started passing them out. The, the adults were all giggling, like my father and my aunt were involved. And they just started passing out these gifts. And we tore them all open. And we played with them all week. But it was so early. How early? It was about a week early. <laughs> and we're, we're all out there playing with our presents and stuff about a week early. And like, you know, the, the very friendly, very nice Christian neighbors down the street who were very strict about when Christmas was supposed to happen and you're supposed to have a tree, you're supposed to have your lights up at a certain time. They were just laughing at us. Like, I remember them giggling because, you know, we were all impatient children, even the adults. (laughs) I think it says more about the maturity of the adults. Oh, it absolutely does. My mother would hide all the presents that were from, quote, Santa and I would go try to find them <laughs> and then pretend I had not found them and try to act surprised by overacting on the day of <laughs> and get caught and get grounded almost every year. Just be like, I had no idea. Thank you for getting me this. <laughs> um, this year I sent my father's present weeks late. Uh, he He lived in Vancouver and we kept saying that we were going to meet up and not to send anything. The idea was, you know, we'd meet downtown or we were going to go on a a train trip to Seattle, like the Pacific train. We're going to take it up to the Space Needle. It's a beautiful scenic ride and you guys could open your gifts and talk father son time. That sounds like a nice Christmas. Exactly. Um, The last few texts I had to him, the text messages that I can read back on, it was, you know, us hammering out the time to go on this trip. And at some point, uh, because I am packing my things and getting ready to move to Texas, I packed his gift and I sent it just so I didn't lose it. I was like, this is going to be easier to send him the gift. In it, I had jotted down a card. And in that card, I had told him all the things I had done this year. I have a pretty strained relationship with my father. Um, I've joked about him on this podcast. I think when you first met me at uh, Story Masters, I would present about writing and contests and writing for articles. And then I would joke about, you know, I would joke about my father who claimed he was a writer and, you know, didn't really put pen to paper. Uh, As David Rakoff says, he mostly liked to drink about it. When I sent that box, the card said, you know, I got published in a VR game this year. Let's go backtrack there. So what you're saying is... Uh, there's substance abuse in the family. Yes, there is. So how many years and how heavy a drinker? Uh, l- how many years was he drinking? Mm-hmm. Um, I actually found out recently that it was very far back. It, it was in his 20s. He started because he liked to smoke weed. And at the time, that was very illegal here in Oregon. And anyone who has seen state laws, they they probably think that we've always been hip deep in you know weed walking down the streets um but it was very legal he was trying to get a job and so he he started drinking because he needed an outlet switch drugs yes um yeah drinking was his going to be his methadone and uh once he started it it was heavy and consistent pretty much ever since So I sent him this box this year and it got to him, but because we so inconsistently speak and because usually when I talk to him, he is inebriated, um, like that addiction has carried through to the point where, uh, in the last couple of years, his health has been declining rapidly. And when I would talk to him, it was spotty whether or not I'd be able to, you know, get a clear message to him. I would tell him things like I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm doing a podcast or I'm writing for, you know, a magazine or something. And he would forget or he would, you know, he would ask later, 
you know, you know, hey, what about my new girlfriend? You know, when when is he going to meet her? And I was like, we already tried this. Like we we told you we were going to be downtown a month ago. Um, it's just forgetful. You know, the the wet brain kind of symptoms, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you could see it in his eyes. Like, you know, it, he, he would drift off. It's frustrating. We've been over this. Dad, come on. Right. <laughs> and he he would talk about age. He would say it sucks getting old, but he wasn't that old. He was exactly 20 years older than me. So he was in his, you know, mid 50s. And he looked cognitively like he was in his late 70s, late 80s. Um, so the box arrived. And on the card, I had written, you know, um, these publications I had done this year. I had written that I got, uh, you know, my license to be a private investigator. And I had written which town I was going to move to uh, when I go south. And so it was just sort of a very brief, very simple recap, you know, just in case you forgot, here's the stuff I've been up to. And I wrote in there, you know, I, I hope you have something, you know, to to be looking forward to this year. That breaks my heart, that last part. That <laughs> yeah. Because he ran out of things to be, to look forward to. Right. When I contacted one of his friends after his death, uh she was the only person of his friends who seemed shocked all of his other friends because he was um, very much into holistic medicine spiritualism ufos aliens (laughs) if anyone who listens to this podcast asks why i don't um why i'm so stuck on science and statistics and um why i have to see proof of things first and a f- UFO loving witch <laughs> dad. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> a rebellion. In all of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Believes Thor is a real dude and all kinds of stuff. Right. So his most of his friends who called me or, or expressed their condolences were like, "Oh, he was so spiritual. Where do you think he went in his death?" Like, like literally asking, "Which moon do I think he landed on?" <laughs> and you're like, "For fuck's sake!" Yeah, and then. <laughs> Um, one of his friends called me and she had become a uh, licensed counselor slash psychologist over the course of the years. Like they had had a falling out. And she, when she asked, you know, how did he die? And I explained, oh, it was a death of despair, um, which it took a long time for me to figure out exactly how he had died. And I'll explain that process. Um, she said she shocked he lasted as long as he did. Um he did not get that package like i it was on his kitchen table when i arrived there to uh, take out his things to to deal with his possessions um it was such a strange way that he passed like he, he he passed away with a roommate who was so drunk when the coroner arrived that um he wouldn't wake up like they knocked on the door, they pounded on it. The guy that was driving the van used to be an ER driver, and or um, ambulance driver, and he he was using. He's he told me he's like I'm used to waking people up who are on substances, and he's like this guy was not waking up. They had to go to the manager get the key, and when they found my father in in the room, uh, he was like up against the door. Um, now he had passed in his sleep. Like I know this which means that the, the medical examiner moved him and did not move him back. So they didn't bother picking him up. They left that for um, the, you know, the county, the, the coroners. It was weird to me, and the thing I want to talk about today for this episode, if you're willing, they did not write his cause of death on the death certificate. Well, as the writer, the fiction writer that you are, what would be symbolic that the, the package got there? before he got to open it and say his goodbyes or his Merry Christmas to you? I mean, obviously there's some symbolism there of disconnect that it arrived literally the morning that it happened and that he just barely missed, you know, opening his Christmas package with, you know, candy and a picture of myself and, you know, my girlfriend and a pair of headphones so he could listen to really, really, really loud music without disturbing his roommate which is a thoughtful um, gift, which is probably a symbol of love, but I also think maybe a symbol that you've known the man for 35 years and you in your subconscious somehow knew that 
this was it. You may not have. <laughs> yeah. Between the. Possibly. I think so. Me agreeing to go on a reminiscing trip to Seattle uh, to see the Space Needle, something we had done when I was very young. Sounds too good to be true a little bit. Yeah. With his behavior and his addiction, with, with, with his elements at this point. I think we both yeah. knew it was going to happen. He had told me something was wrong, that the hospitals weren't catching. And he felt something was... He had asked in multiple ways, in several kind of heartbreaking ways, for more time. Not not from the doctors, but he was asking me, and I didn't know what he was asking. Um, so I don't think the Christmas package was exactly what he needed, but I don't think he knew how to ask because he had burnt so many family bridges before. It was tough for him to get any of our time, uh, telling us that he needed you know, time with us and that things were drastically wrong. We had heard that in the past. We knew that when he said something was wrong, it meant he needed money or a place to stay, or it meant he just sort of wanted to get us on the phone so he could argue with us for a while. You've got a lot of good stories about your dad. Now I'll do. I'll, I'll dig into some of them later. But <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, the thing that I want to sort of discuss today is it's weird to me they didn't write his actual cause of death on the medical record. And yet when I looked into this, um, a death of despair is overcoming the country. It is so That's... much more prevalent than I thought it was. That sounds like a made up fictional like she died of a broken heart. It really does, doesn't it? <laughs> um This is a real thing. It is a real thing. And I actually have who coined the term, how common it is, and why we're about to see a lot of millennials become deaths of despair. And we have the statistics for that too. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no da on the internet. This is a tough one for me. You know, Joe and I have, it's hard to define our relationship, but we've been working on creative projects now, speeches, podcasts, public speaking, training seminars for three years now. So we're, we're more than friends. We're like brothers, but Joe's very guarded. He's brutally honest. He's very sensible. So all those things kind of go out the window when your father passes on. When you hear the shattering of glass, it's me throwing an ashtray at Todd and crying that he doesn't understand me. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm. It, this has now been about um, a month. It's it's maybe a little bit, a little bit more than a month. So, I have had some time to process. Um, but I kind of want to take this opportunity to just say that there is no such thing as too overwhelming. There's, there's no such thing as a, um, you know, having too big of a reaction, being dramatic. There's, there's no such thing as a wrong reaction to death. Um, so we just want to remind the audience that if anybody feels overwhelmed or depressed or anxious and is becoming too much grief or no grief, it doesn't matter what the reason is, seek professional help. And I want to share a little bit about that too. We start so many episodes by saying we're not doctors and we believe in seeking help. I am, as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, I've started uh, with a therapist. And that's just to let everyone know that you can be mentally stable and honest with yourself and you can go seek help. It, there's never a bad time for it. And you don't have to wait until you're really you know, close to suicide or severely depressed to get help and get get right before that, before we go to the bottom of all bottoms. Right. Climbers secure their safety hooks before they need them. That's how mental health should work too. So don't start falling first. And I don't think all 
all deaths are the same. You know, I can say, well, I lost my father too. And I don't think they're the same because people lose them at different times. And not only is it different times of their life, they have different relationships with the person who's passed. Right. Some are wonderful, some are strained, and both are hard. You know, when, when they're strained relationships and they're unhealthy relationships, there's a lot of regrets too that, that you don't have in loved relationships. Everybody's different, and there's never like a, a opportune time to lose somebody. There are losses that can happen for expected reasons. Natural causes is usually what we write down when somebody goes from old age, even if that old age is from heart attack, cancer, something like that. Um, we knew it was coming, so we got to prepare. Right. But, but when you just find out that day, that's the Will Smith slap in the face. Right. <laughs> that is the, the unexpected Tuesday evening call. Um, uh, strangely, natural causes is actually what they wrote on his death certificate. Uh, when I got the call and I, I eventually got his death certificate, um, they settled with natural causes. Um, I also found out that a lot of times if somebody passes from drug overdose, they will just write heart attack. So there are ways on a death certificate to write things where you don't have to actually write the quote unquote cause where you're mostly just writing, um, what was the expected reason? I went to this play when I was a kid and I remember this like it was yesterday. It would have been 1989, 90, and it was about HIV and that was a real hot subject at the time and people were dying from it all over the country and all over the world and this, it was a play and it was really dramatic about these different couples who, who all got uh, HIV in different ways and one of the moms of the boys who had passed who was a drug user said my son was not a drug addict he died of pneumonia he didn't have HIV he <laughs> died of pneumonia it says it right here on the birth on the death certificate I thought that's a, so he didn't he died of pneumonia yeah um, a couple of years ago when my mother passed, it was complications with opioids and that was what they wrote is pneumonia. <laughs> um, it she did, her- it was heroin. It was, it was, it was weak, a weakened immune system from persistent use of opioids basically. So it was a kind of pneumonia. Um, now I'm going to go to sort of the definitions. We'll start with that just because this is such a complex, dense issue. I want to start with the um, the dry things first, the things that, you know, will let us start cracking this door open. Um, at Princeton, there were a couple of economists that came up with the term death of despair, and that was Annie Case and Angus Deaton. And they first started looking into it uh, because they notice that people with college degrees specifically you know white men and women with four-year degrees were weirdly dying of suicide and drug overdose and alcohol related liver disease early uh, shockingly early um so they coined the term death of despair and when they dug into it they looked into those three causes specifically and how they are tied into addiction and depression uh, they found out that of those three reasons, um, you it was 158,000 people a year were dying in the U.S., uh, which they said is the equivalent of three fully loaded Boeing 737s falling out of the sky every day for a year. Um, but my father had a lot of other conditions, too. He, he was, I mean, like reading through this list, um, I got a copy of his medical record. Oh, by the way. Um, this was a good time for me to sort of use my private investigator skills <laughs> when they didn't have his cause of death on his paper. That was me looking at it as sort of a, a case to solve. I've only done a couple of volunteer things with that license uh, and some lawyer assistance. So this was sort of a neat time for me to dig in and, and see what I could find. Um, he had hypertension, which... Todd and I both have high blood pressure. Uh, 47% of Americans have high blood pressure to some degree. Um, He had diabetes. So did, you know, 37 million Americans, 10%. And that's going up every year by a lot. Um, One in five Americans know someone who died of complications with opioids. His wife, well, ex-technically, went the same way, as we discussed 
Um, he had anxiety, depression, uh, neuropathy from drinking. Basically, everything that was wrong with him, we have talked about or skirted about in this podcast in some way. And I don't want to linger on that too long uh, because this is a podcast about self-improvement and empowerment. I just wanted to say that like, even medical professionals are too tired to care about these because they are so prevalent in American society. They will label it natural causes. It's easier to do that. How many of these do you think go away if the drinking goes away? If you eliminate drinking, you reduce how many people have hypertension by a lot. Uh, drinking is an exacerbating part of diabetes. Um, opioids, I'm not sure about. You can definitely get addicted to opioids without alcohol being part of it. But anxiety and depression are made worse with drinking. So it may not be the cause of a lot of these, but it will complicate the hell out of them very quickly. And we all know, you know, I come from a family. My brother died from heroin. He got di- he died by getting hit by a car, but it was because he was stumbling into the street, high out of his mind. So his death certificate is not at thirty one years old is not going to say <laughs> it's going to say he got hit by a car and had a head trauma and died. But that's not what happened, right? But we all know, you know, I have a family. My my grandfather, my uncle, my father's had alcohol drug problems. Um, but my grandfather was the worst of the worst because he just got nastier and nastier. He had all of everything in the world, had a family that loved him, and he just became a recluse in his own, you know, in his own head and just became a nasty, mean person and pretty much sucked every ounce of joy out of the world. Right. I went to a Toastmaster meeting once where one of the women very candidly talked about her brother who had been a um, first an opium addict, and then he had switched to heroin. Uh, Heroin was his way to get away from opium, strangely enough. And that statistic here in Oregon bears out that heroin use went up after, um, you know, doctors started cracking down on how many opium prescriptions they gave out. And she talked about how it was like sandpaper, that if you have a addict in the family... It's emotional sandpaper. You, you know, you want to care over and over and over again until you are sanded down. And then once you do, you know, once you're out of the ability to care, you've been worn down and blunted. Then something tragic happens and you don't have any more emotion for it. Like it's hard to even react to it. If if I want to illustrate his like the way he drank like if we're going to talk about well, let's let's talk about liver damage if you're okay with that we're we're going to skip the myths for today but really the big myth we want to talk about is before covid our medical system was too tired to care i think that is going to be the 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 one myth today is hospitals are profit centers and they started limiting patient doctor interactions to less than 17 minutes of visit and that was five years ago. So it, it's not getting better. Um, and that gets substantially worse if somebody is coming in with a um, an illness that they have done to themselves. It's not that they get less time or less care. It's just much harder for people to have sympathy for them. Well, I've been in the people business a long time. And I know from a fact that it takes longer than 17 minutes for people to feel comfortable and be able to be honest with you (laughs) even if you're a lawyer or a doctor exactly that is a really good way to put it so you don't have any good information at that point so you're just making decisions based on on whatever right next right it's it's the cash register find out what this guy's insurance is and let's get on to the next one yeah it is a processing line so if you want to have an idea of his drinking um we used to live on the coast and there were um, sea lions that would come by every year and they would lay out on this jetty, just this long stretch of sand into the ocean. 
and there were hundreds like they would all you know people stop in in newport here on the coast to see a couple of sea lions at the docks and they'll lay there and people can throw fish to them and laugh and you know it's cute you bark at them they bark back it's fun right um if you're in waldport you can see hundreds of them and they tell you don't go to the beach when they're there because if they get frightened they will stampede they'll either run away from you and they'll you know get into the water or the males will sometimes attack they they <laughs> they're they're afraid they're but like if you corner pounds. them yeah They'd probably bite like a lion that'd be a horrible way to go getting dragged <laughs> to your death <laughs> right that would be a death of despair <laughs> Yeah, killed by the cutest animal on earth, uh, which is <laughs> when you're taking a picture, you're right? Too close. Um, so Bryce and I, uh, one of my friends, friend of the podcast, you know, uh, friend who's gone to Toastmasters with us, um, we went to the beach with my father. It wasn't, it wasn't late at night. It wasn't after you know a house party. This was just him. Like we, we went out, he would carry a tumbler of vodka like he was Rodney Dangerfield. And, um, Your he dad went out or Bryce. No, my father. Sorry. Yeah. My, my father would, would carry around a tumbler of alcohol and it, I don't even know if there was anything in it. It was probably just straight vodka. And we went out and looked at these seals and we stayed away because it's this 200 seal pod. And, um, he started going up to one and Bryce and I just stood back. Like we waited, like we we were like, what are you, what are you doing? You live here, you know, not to do this. And we watched him like start creeping closer and he got down, like he bent at the knees and he stretched out his hand. Like he was trying to be, you know, you ever see, um, crocodile Dundee where he <laughs> hypnotizes the bull. He's doing this with one hand and in the other one, he's balancing a drink oh, and, boy. We stood back because we were expecting to see the most hilarious death anyone's ever caught on the Oregon coast. We thought we were going to watch him get mauled by an adorable seal and then dragged into the water. (laughs) And honestly, eaten by a seal would have been the way he wanted to go. Um, But we watched him pet this seal. and Like a dog. Dumbfounded. Yeah. Like he's petting it and he's, he's pressing his hand to it like he's communicating with it. And then he, he walked back and we asked, you know, what was that? Like, what what were you doing? And he's like, oh, it, it's dead. <laughs> he oh, was, my God. He was petting a dead seal. It had been dead for hours and hours. It had stayed out there all day. Like, <laughs> oh, it probably came clever. in the sun in the morning. He was just teasing you guys. I, I don't think so. I, th- I think he was a kooky enough hippie and so into, you know, his own mystic powers that... This made him one with nature, petting a, a basically roadkill of the ocean. <laughs> so um, if you want to know, it, that's, that story probably tells you everything you need to know about my father's drinking and, and you know what it looked like in person. Okay, do you have young friends or, or anybody that you have seen who is around millennial age who is developed a drinking problem myself included i'm definitely going to include myself in this i've seen rage not in myself yeah i mean i wasn't uncommon for me in my early 20s to drink 20 plus beers a day pretty consistently by consistently i mean every single day right (laughs) and i think you drank a bottle of stuff or at least a half a bottle a day or something right you tell me yeah i was um i would drink it was more than a six pack a day of something stronger than 10%. And oftentimes it was half a bottle to a bottle a day in total. It was a lot. The one alcoholic uh, quote that I, I really remember is from Eddie Van Halen, the guitarist. And he said that he used to, when he, when he was, his drinking was his worst, he would have to drink a six pack of beer to feel okay every day. Yeah. And I've personally had that. Um, withdrawals where you wake up and you you can't really think or you know you're kind of trembling and then you drink a beer and you actually feel normal right yeah I, i think that's a good way of putting it is you get to a point where you drink so that your brain settles back to what it should be um and i don't know how to describe that to somebody who has never drank before you don't feel good you still feel like shit you still feel hungover you still feel terrible you still feel dull 
Right. But you can at least function. Like I mean, I'm at points I remember not being able to talk. Have you ever met guys at work who like they will drink an incredible amount, way more than you think they should be able to, and then they function well enough to do something <laughs> professionally? Like they will replumb Absolute. your pipes. I used to hang out with these guys when I worked for HSBC. We go to these huge conferences, and and these guys would would stay out till five o'clock and then be at the meeting at seven, just look perfectly fresh. And, and I was never one of those. You shared the story about the seal, but that was kind of an endurance story. That was kind of a, do you have any of the dark stuff that you saw that was like embarrassing to you or just really disappointed you or scared you? Yeah, there, there was lots of those. Um, one that I remember is, um, one of the reasons why nobody took him seriously when he told us he was fear, feeling very sick and very ill um, this round is because when uh, my brother and I were teenagers, he drank himself very sick and um, went to bed. And then he got one of his friends to come over and check on him. And then he very melodramatically called us into the room and told us that he was dying that night. And they want to like share his wisdom of the ages with us. Like he literally said, I want to share my wisdom with you. And we both just rolled our eyes and walked away. And we're like, you know, this, this son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was so sad. Like it, 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 of course he didn't die. He was being dramatic and he had drank himself into a, a depressive state. Um, and we were so used to it as a hijinks that we didn't give it credit for anything. But it was a real marker for depression. Like it, it yeah. obviously, like he, he That's wanted attention. To cry for help. It was, yeah, absolutely. Um, and people listening to this, they might think this is such an alien idea that like, you know, oh, I don't know anybody like that. I guarantee you know somebody like that. I was a functional alcoholic for years. I mean, nobody is technically not an alcoholic. Once you burn those circuits into your brain, it, it's there. Um, but that's one in eight Americans right now. Like w one out of eight people is a full blown alcoholic to the, um, the clinical definition. And even though you don't see the blows and the bottoms, the people who live with them and are related to them do. Yeah. I think very few people in my life, everyone knew I drank. Very few people knew that it was as bad as it was. I did. I was good at concealing you know how bad it got i think okay so um i'm gonna quote npr here um npr says that the rise of alcoholic liver disease especially among young women is an off the charts epidemic i kind of wanted to try to find numbers and like i want to try to find you know exactly how bad it is but i think having everybody who is lumped into the death of despair we talked about the you know a full boeing crashes you know or was it three full full boeings a day that should be enough like i, I don't think that an alcoholic liver is a terrible way to go and we're seeing young people go from it um and the funny thing is we still in medical practice dismiss alcoholics uh, who need a new liver so like we triage them there's uh, if anyone is unaware of this if you are an alcoholic and your liver gives out um they won't transplant you a liver until you've been sober for a year which means that in the time you need it you probably won't get it um but it seems fair if it wasn't you or your family member <laughs> right it seems like we can't just give you another one if you're gonna abuse it it's like you go out and wreck a car we can't buy you another one you know, until you take it seriously that you're going to be able to take care of it. Right. That's the thinking behind it is we shouldn't give you a liver if you've burned yours and you, you haven't gotten sober yet. You should have a year under your belt at least to show that you're not going to ruin your new liver. Um, but pretty much every study I could find, um, and we'll link off to these, uh, they all basically said that that's, um, it's good wise thinking but nothing in science upholds it like statistically you know people that need a liver transplant that's enough that that will usually get them off of drinking not everybody obviously but statistically if you get to the point where you need a major surgery um you know people reprioritize and if they can stop at that point they you know 
it, it it is weird that almost all the stuff we're going to talk about today about addiction is effectively how we look at addiction wrong. Um, so when I started looking into his death certificate, why they put natural causes down, my first thought was alcoholism. Uh, and that's everyone's like, <laughs> even just me telling the story about, you know, the, the sea lion, I bet everybody listening to the sound of my voice is like, yeah, obviously it was the drinking that did it. You know, that would make the most sense. You've just heard part one out of our two-part series on Deaths of Despair. Next week, we'll talk about the medical system and why my father's death certificate said a death of natural causes. We'll also talk about what it looks like when insurance companies start using air and fatigue as a system for billing and profit. Tune in next week as we go a little bit farther down the rabbit hole.